nineteen ninety seven. You're you know senior in high school. Wow. Jonathan is a snitch. Did you see that, Jonathan? I I, I do see it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm trying not to get these people's identity stolen. But yes, I will snitch and say, take your stuff down. Right. Well, that's that's in a good way. Ideas would hunt me down. Right. Lots of chatter. I view Facebook like a billboard. Don't post anything you don't want the whole world to see. Yes, I agree, Stephanie. Don't have Facebook at all. Right. Okay, great. Reading the comments. I did. I tried that too, Jonathan. I had an internet birthday, but then I forgot what it was and then I got locked out of things. I was born in 1913. All right. Lovely. Let's turn. Thank you for your comments. Make my Christmas good. Okay. I am going to turn this over to. Here it is. The two gentlemen that are presenting tonight. I believe we'll be hearing from Jonathan and Justin. So I will. Um, who wants control? Jonathan? I'll take it. Jonathan. Pardon me? Jonathan? Yes. I can get. There you go. Woo, I have the power. Okay. The power. <laughs> Hello, all. Uh, my name is Jonathan Garwood, and uh, Justin Grunberg is also going to be presenting with me. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about the Internet of Things. Uh, so, what is the Internet of, of Things? Uh, I know we've been talking about all the you know concerns we've had about it, but what is it? Uh, does anybody have any input on what is immediately laying around them that might be an internet of things. Like I have a, my personal and my work cell phone sitting right in front of me and a computer and a couple other things. Anybody? Same. So the fact that I can uh, change the temperature of my house from anywhere in the world, that's kind of an internet of things, right? Because my furnace or my, my thermostat, my house has a wireless connection that, uh, that I can access remotely. That's, yeah. that's kind of an example. Yes, it is. That's exactly what we're talking about, the Nest. I've actually found that to be most useful when somebody's working on my AC and I need to turn it on on command, which is handy. All right, so uh, what is it? The Internet of Things is all the things that connect and talk to each other. Uh, so it's not, it's also, it's the objects themselves, uh, but every object has a sensor and needs to communicate other things. Uh, it can be through a very traditional protocol, just like a, a Edo 211 something, uh, or it can be a, through a newer one like uh, like that the Nest uses or other devices. Um, but all the things all together that exist in a complete ecosystem, that is the Internet of Things. So where is it? Um, so a, a nice big question that I have for everybody is how many Internet of Things devices how many communicating devices do you have in your house right now in your house your apartment right now uh, all these things and many more your car uh, your nest your your thermostat uh, and your cell phone any computers uh, I have a smart watch uh, network attached storage printer anything like that uh, these are all internet of things that you just have in your house that you don't really don't really think about it every day but you're using them so we can, we can get a list of who's got the most. I, I personally counted 35 in my house. Wow. But it, it's also me and my wife, and we're pretty techie. <laughs> 35. Wow. Yes. I bet we all have more than we think we have. Uh, no, well, I, don't, I don't think my cat is an Internet <laughs> of Things. Uh, I, I did recently, we did recently get our cat uh, chipped, uh, but I don't think, I, I, I left that off the list of Internet of Things. 
<laughs> so, all right. The point of this is just to get everybody to realize that uh, there are so many things around us that have this Internet of Things capabilities. Uh, it's not it's not some new technology that's suddenly coming out. It's been there for a little bit, and we've been using it. Uh, so this is it's not the future. It's today. Rawr. Okay. So. How do companies use this whole Internet of Things? It's been existing for a long time. How do companies make it work for them? Uh, well, uh, Gartner actually lays out four different ways that companies can use it. Uh, they can use it to manage their stuff, to make sure the assets are you know, being used properly. Uh, they can use it to monetize, basically gather giant amounts of data uh, and then sell either the analysis of that data or just the data itself to, for a profit. Um, they can operate with it. With it. Uh, so, for example, a nest controls its surroundings, or uh, say if you're in a, a manufacturing plant, you can have sensors on different pieces of equipment so that maybe if it says, hey, I've got two little supplies, then that, you know, someone runs over and throws more, throws more supplies in that machine, something like that. Uh, and the last one is extend. Uh, it's just providing uh, basically, so for example, Say you're checking into a hotel, uh, and each hotel room has a little thing in it that says this hotel room is full, is, is occupied. Uh, that, that could be an Internet of Things, where it would make your service and service experience a lot easier, a lot better. So that's how companies can use the Internet of Things to turn a profit. Now we're going to go into the survey, since you know what it is. Uh, so this is a survey I've ever took. Get your nice results in here. So... Uh, we have most of the people, most of the people in the class have uh, that your company does use the Internet of Things to do something. Uh, we've had, had a wide variety of responses as to what the Internet of Things does in your company uh, from uh, it's fun <laughs> to uh, like as we've seen in the forum post that uh, some companies uh, have really leveraged. Internet of Things to provide uh, new capabilities that you know we weren't, weren't expecting, and they're really cool. Uh, and it seems that everybody that said no that their company doesn't use it uh, said that yeah, the Internet of Things could definitely make a difference at their company. All right. So the next one here uh, in your personal life, do you utilize any Internet of Things services or devices? Uh, there were not very many people that said no, so. As we expected, kind of, uh, yeah, there, there was only 11% of people said that they didn't use any Internet of Things stuff. Uh, so the vast majority of people have some sort of devices around them. I would imagine that those three people who said no, um, is there anybody that wants to speak up that said no? I guess not. I mean, John, can oh. I... Can I, uh, I, I, I put yes, but uh, I do have a question for you. So and maybe you'll cover this later. And if so, I'm sorry. So okay. I, I view this, the internet of things more as a marketing buzzword, right? A lot of the things that I would characterize as an internet of things device have been around for a while. They, they seem to predate the concept of the internet of things really. Where's, where is the, the line drawn, right? I mean, is something as simple as a smartphone, which I guess technically, yeah, I mean, it's by definition is connected to, to other devices. I mean, is that truly an Internet of Things device? So the answer to your question is yes. The usage and the existence of the Internet of Things was, it was there before the concept was, you know, brought into form and being. Uh, and no, I don't go to get to that later in the presentation. So is it is it fair to say then I guess the 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 difference really is the the medium in, with which they communicate with each other uh, right I mean just the the ubiquity of of Ethernet based networks or 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 just whatever transmission medium they happen to use whether it's a mesh network or whatever they just didn't exist as little as a few years ago. Right, uh, that's one of the things that. Uh... We don't really touch on it in, in this presentation, but yes, the, the literature does say that that is the next source of like big expansion for the Internet of Things is just the uh, capability of connectivity, just worldwide connectivity that the Internet provides that uh, we're not really leveraging is that as much as we could with, you know, a billion or more devices connected uh, that there could. Yeah, with, with <laughs> once IPv6 comes in, yes, we could definitely have a billion different 
sensors that are out there. They're all putting in their little two cents and definitely have an internet of all the things, which could be weird. Uh, any more? Okay, all right, moving on. So, uh, do you believe personal, your, your personal use of Internet of Things has a noticeable positive, positive impact on your life? Uh, this was not overwhelming, overwhelmingly, but uh, all the people said, yes, we like having the Internet Things in our life. Uh, from I'm kind of neutral about it to yes, all of it. I really like it. So apparently we are we are happy with the technology overlords coming. So the last question is what are your big fears? What are your big concerns about the Internet of Things? And as we can see here, uh, the, the coming of the artificial intelligence overlords in the singularity is is of, of you know one of the least concerns. Uh, our big concerns are privacy and security, as uh, we actually already uh, covered a bit in the forum topics. So and, any questions, any inputs here? That's the last bit of the survey. I mean, really, privacy and security are, are kind of two two sides of the same coin, right? Yes and no. You can have security that works flawlessly. Uh, and still be worried about your employer or others seeing and gathering more information about you than you thought. Uh, so imagine uh, imagine Facebook and how much information it takes. Uh, it, ha it can have flawless security, but you're still really, really worried about how much information Facebook is taking about you. Uh, it, there's app there's little little uh, programs that embed into that a lot of pro uh, websites embedded in their stuff. Like every time I buy something on Newegg, it asks me if I want to want to share about it on Facebook. Uh, and so, you know, one one company knowing everything about all my buy, all my buying, all my surfing, all my everything, internet habits, uh, that can be a privacy concern for me. Do I really, even if I trust that company to keep it locked up in a in a room all only for that company? Do I really want that company to have all this information about me? So yes, they are different concerns. Especially when we're taking, uh, say like, like myself, if I've got my work phone at home, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure it's fully within my employer's rights to be listening to me right now as they give you this presentation. So uh, please nobody be rude to my employer. Okay, anything else? All right, so now uh, we've been touching on it a bit, uh, but we're gonna go over into what what are the two main things that can go wrong and how do we fight them in uh, the internet of things. The first one is connectivity. Uh, what protocols and what methodologies do we use to actually make all these things internet together? Uh, and the second one is authentication, uh, which is a, the strong part of security. Uh, making sure that we're the only people that talk to our things. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Justin. All right, Justin, I'll keep Thank control. You go ahead. Cool. Can everybody hear me loud and clear? Yes, I'll assume so. Cool. All right. So, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about connectivity uh, in terms of the multitude of Internet of Things devices that uh, are out there in the world. As you can see by uh, this figure here, you know, you have different types of networks, obviously, right? You have the personal area network, local area network, and then it expands out from there. Uh, most of us, when we're dealing with consumer grade stuff, you know, we're dealing with personal area networks and local area networks. Of course, they can report out to the larger ones, but uh, in those realms, we're dealing with like NFC, uh, Wi Fi. Uh, Bluetooth types of connectivity. And so <clears throat> I think we're all pretty much familiar with those to a certain extent. Uh, and when it changes, of course, is when you go to the enterprise level, uh, because then you're looking at a much larger scope of things and you're looking at devices from uh, that can serve a large variety of uses. 
So uh, some of some of the, the things that you want to take into account when you're when you're dealing with connectivity at the enterprise level is uh, you know how are the devices going to connect? What protocols, communication protocols? are they implementing? Is it, uh, are they gonna just be hardwired to the enterprise's ethernet network? Will they run off of the Wi-Fi infrastructure? Uh, these are obviously important to know because when you're designing the, the network, you need to take into account uh, how the applications will be communicating with the devices, so your servers and uh, what can help there is taking into account the current and the future views uh, established by the EA. And based on those views, then you can draft up a plan for implementation based on the way that the different devices connect. Now, the next slide uh, gives you a breakdown in a table view of different types of connections, right? So we're very familiar with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, then we get into technologies like Zigbee, uh, six low W pan, which is very interesting. I had not uh, heard of that before, but based on what I've read, it's uh, and very interesting emerging uh, connectivity technology. Uh, it has the ability to communicate with any IP-based server device on the internet, and so it can exchange data with hardware utilizing both Wi-Fi and Ethernet connections. Uh, as you can see there, it also uh, integrates mesh network topology, low power consumption. So it has a few things that some of the other uh, technologies do not have. And so based on the types of devices that you're putting out onto your network, it may be uh, the type of technology that you are looking uh, to move towards. So, uh, you can see, I mean, of course, power, when you're dealing with these systems and these devices, uh, power is a big uh, factor. And so that's certainly uh, another consideration. Mm, in addition to that, right, uh, when you're looking at a wireless land-based environment from the valuation level, the initial valuation level, you'd want to take into account the usage scenarios of the clients. So uh the bandwidth the latency and things like that uh of course latency when you're looking at medical applications and medical internet of thing devices uh latency is imperative right because and with industrial applications as well you need something that is going to communicate without much of a delay uh and so that's very important to to keep in mind uh Security is also a critical element to be planned for. Uh, as you can see there, that is a study done by HP, which found uh, some pretty substantial uh, security vulnerabilities in a variety of Internet of Things home uh, systems. So you can see there like 100% of the home security systems tested were vulnerable to account harvesting. And like we talked about and we see in the survey results, privacy and security are things that people are very concerned with. And when you see statistics like that from a recent survey, it's not a very, uh, it doesn't make you feel good inside, right? Gives you a little bit of, a little bit of fear. Uh, and that's due to things like the the company is not requiring uh strong having strong password policies and uh things of that sort so uh now when you're when you're looking at security rights there's and from the enterprise level uh you can look into v of course v landing air gapping and things to segregate the different networks that you have so you can meet the security needs while still allowing for things like guest access to uh, the different applications or systems. End-to-end uh, -end encryption is also strongly recommended uh, for implementation of these devices on the, the enterprise network. Uh, and so now we're gonna, this is veering kind of into the authentication type of stuff too, and so I'll touch on that uh, shortly, but 
establishing trusted communication channels between so there's okay so we'll go to, yeah we'll go to documentation then i'll jump into this no hop single hop multi hop authentication stuff in a bit but uh documentation as you can see you know it can kind of be uh a trash heap that we dig our way out of or try to make sense of i think we're all familiar with that uh so one of the best practices recommended by Gardner is to, uh, and this is going to be kind of obvious to most of us, but documenting the findings from the initial evaluation of uh, the network and the, the Internet of Things devices is essential, right? So creating a central repository where this information can be placed, as well as uh, keeping records of any application demands, right, which are similar to the usage scenarios of the clients and how these are needed to meet the business outcomes should be contained within this uh, document documentation repository. Uh, to go along with, with that, uh, and there are some of the things that you wanna, of course, record within the documentation, right? So the radio performance of the worst case device. So you have a baseline upon which to build so you know that in your installation, you will meet the needs of that worst case device. And if you can meet those needs, then chances are pretty good that you're gonna be able to meet the needs of the more uh, advanced devices with, with the better radios, better, better power, uh, better range, things like that. You wanna record the types of devices, application demands, da da da, da yeah. So, and uh, part of the documentation then is to create a performance-based, device connectivity policy. And that guarantees that performance needs will be met for the worst case devices, as I mentioned previously. And so you can then provide that information to consultants and outside contractors to help them determine the best physical implementation of network resources. Uh, so when you're thinking of planning, it allows the contractors to come in and know where to put the physical, you know, like uh, wireless access points and whatnot so that the the environment is is fully fully covered uh, in terms of the wireless networks that you're that you're working off of, uh, and it also allows a business to be able to better determine whether or not incremental investments in boosting the network will yield positive returns. So, if you implement some system and you have it. Uh, documented within the device connectivity policy and everything, then when you look at it, you can, if it's thorough enough, right, if the documentation is thorough enough, you can make predictions as to how, if you change something, what that will trickle down to and, and affect in terms of the user, the end user's experience and, uh, right, and, and how it will meet the, the business needs. So, uh, yeah, there, this is, uh, now go ahead and jump back, Jonathan, if you would. Yeah, so when we're dealing with vendors, uh, this is an another best practice and I think common common knowledge, but of course it's imperative to hold the vendors accountable for the things that they control. So when it comes to warranties, service agreements, uh, site surveys, post-installation monitoring, things like that, you, those uh, not necessarily intangible things, but uh, those can really separate one vendor from another. And so those are definitely things to keep in mind when you are uh, setting forth on your IoT implementation at the enterprise level. So yeah, that was a, that was a GIF. Jonathan pointed out the fact that if I tried to run a GIF uh, via this, this canvas, it probably would have stalled out, but just imagine the cats like dancing around doing office things. Uh, but now let's jump to the next slide uh, and we'll start talking about authentication here and how that plays into connectivity and the role of uh, Internet of Things devices. So uh, as you can see there, the definition of it is an interaction between two entities with a defined relationship between those two entities. So what you're, doing it. how do you uh confirm that a, a device is a trusted device on your network right how, how do you exchange some information that says that is a 
secure device that I recognize that I want to establish this share shared relationship with. So uh, it of course plays a vital role in securing access to and from many Internet of Thing devices. Uh, it many of the devices are not considered general purpose computers. Uh, but instead are built as fit for purpose devices. So this presents a security challenge uh, because end product may result in a constrained node, which means that the node lacks some basic functionality that may be otherwise taken for granted. Uh, constrained nodes are often due to cost constraints uh, that may limit the size, weight, the power, like I talked about earlier, memory, processing power of the device. You have different classes of device, right? And you have, uh, class zero, class one, and class two devices, and each one of those are of a different kind of uh, hardware robustness, right? So like a class zero device would be something with very little onboard RAM that might just be like an RFID chip or something like that, right? And then class at the class two level, you have uh, laptops, servers, and, and devices of, of that, uh level so there are the more in-depth classification descriptions you can you can read those uh as you see fit uh and so it's important when you're looking at authentication here in an iot architecture the different ways in which you can establish those types of relationships so uh when you're looking at class zero and class one devices you do see a significant significant loss uh, in what can be assured due to the fact that they're just not as robust devices. So uh, it's also true that the the industry standards for implementation of class zero and one devices has led the vendors to develop their own proprietary authentication methods, which can lead to difficulties, right? When you're implementing uh, or planning to bring these devices into your enterprise. Uh, to go along with that, of course, there are vulnerabilities dealing with uh, like Bluetooth to internet to cellular types of communications. Uh, of course, you can have eavesdropping or snooping where an eavesdropper is listening on the commands issued and the data that's transferred to the network, uh, sometimes revealing sensitive information about the operation of the infrastructure you can have a, a replay vulnerability where an attacker sniffs the network traffic, captures authentic messages or commands going to the receiver and then retransmits it later. Uh, and there's a few other ones as well. So uh, if we jump to the next slide, you'll see the single, the no hop, single hop, multi hop type of authentication uh, relationship that can help uh, define trusted devices on a network. Uh, when you have like a, a no hop relationship, right? The devices are constrained to a local network, which is controlled by a local trust anchor. Single hop, you know, you're kind of jumping uh, from one device to a gateway or anchor, and then that gateway or anchor relays that communication to the host, making it authenticated. And then multi hop is when you have uh, two gateways at a minimum, right, on their respective constraint networks and uh, the devices on those networks go from there to those gateways and then up to uh, the host to authenticate between the disparate networks. Uh, let's see here. So that, I believe, is authentication in a nutshell. Here we go. So PKI, right. Uh, so public key infrastructure uh you can see the description of it there commonly used uh and relevant technology for iot authentication by organizations uh and delegation of trust uh yeah so cry cryptographic operations uh class one and two devices more robust things needing to run those uh higher level authentication methods and it, uh, as you can see there, also provides sufficient means for class zero devices to participate in high assurance authentication processes. 
And I do believe that now I will pass it back to Jonathan to wrap up uh, the presentation. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank yes, you. Thank you. And so I'm now going to be talking about, now that we've talked about what is the Internet of Things and what are some problems with it, how do you actually take it and make it work at your company? So uh, Gartner actually lays out a pretty simple five-step process on how to do that. First, you want to determine at like the strategic level, why am I wanting to do this? So the big question is, why do I want the Internet of Things? You want to determine what benefits you want to actually have the whole thing produced for you as an end result. Uh, and you want to make sure that, you know, the strategy your company has uh, aligns with those benefits that you want to get. It's not like just some random benefit out there. Hey, I want to make some cameras and go see out and look at the buildings around us when I sell t-shirts. And that doesn't really help my company strategy. Uh, so I want to make sure that, you know, it's not just more technology for technology's sake, but it actually forwards the strategy and function of your business. So once you get this outlined, uh, you want to start looking at, uh, like, basically you want to brainstorm all the different opportunities that this is going to provide for you. So uh, where basically where would the Internet of Technology, Internet of Things technology fit? Uh, and so that's this is the where would Internet, what, where would IFT fit in my organization uh, to provide these benefits? Where where would it fit in? Uh, and then with that, you can link that where it would fit in back to the capabilities of this is what IoT is capable of. This is the off the shelf. This is what exists in the technology to be able to use. Uh, and once you've brainstormed all these things and linked it back to ex existing stuff, uh, you want to make sure that you're actually prioritizing the useful stuff. So like, for example, uh, for a train company, prioritizing the drones that go look at uh, the condition of the track ahead to make sure it's open and clear and whole uh, versus the uh, versus, I don't know, a different sensor that uh, might just make the uh, make the engine just that, you know, half a percent more efficient. Uh, so, you know, the different different applications that you might be able to use for your stuff, you want to be able to prioritize the things that are going to be better for your company. So once you've done that, uh, you can actually set out uh, the scope of these use cases. So in the, that last slide, we actually set up like the use case of this is where it would work. Uh, and now we want to make sure that those are actually feasible, that te technology really does support that. Uh, and that we look at all these different variables. So these are different things that uh, you can look, you can look at the, if you're going to be implementing this in your company, you're going to be want to looking at uh, all these different variables. Uh, and so the performance requirements, the what impact it's going to have on your organization uh, and the number of endpoints and endpoint is basically any internet of things device uh, and what those endpoints are going to be doing. And you want to keep an eye out for all the risks and how you're going to manage those risks uh, to make sure that this thing doesn't get, you know, your things doesn't get super complex. Uh, and if there's any regulatory or legal considerations that you might want to look at. So once you've set the scope, so you're not going to, you know, go crazy with it. Uh, you want to figure out how this is actually going to work at your company. Uh, you want to go look at the different Internet of Things vendors uh, and figure out what, what their applications look like. Uh, what, what do the different devices look like at, at a device level? How do they fit together? Uh, how would all these things as an ecosystem, that's a fun term that gets thrown around a lot, ecosystem, uh, all these things working together, all the Internet of Things devices working together in one and uh, providing benefits to the organization, that's the ecosystem. How does that get implemented for all these different vendors? And then uh, once you've picked a vendor and said, all right, well, maybe I want to look at these different vendors. Maybe I have two that I really like. Then you want to run a little pilot test. Just run it quickly and uh, deploy it somewhere. See what happens. Uh, and make sure you keep track of all the, the benefits that is actually being provided by the, your deployment, uh, what, what the users like about it. Uh, I mean, if the users really, really hate it and don't like having a big bulky device on them all the time, then maybe it might not be useful. But if the users really, really like it and it's making a difference for them, then you might want to go out of your way to bring it in. 
Uh, you want to make sure the infrastructure is working, all the architecture that's behind it to make to, to uh, all the planning and stuff that needs to go behind there, all the security that's available for it, and uh, what devices actually ended up existing in, in this deployment. Once you've done all that, you've got all the things you need to be able to look at and compare and be like, all right, this is the deployment we're going with and deploy it at your organization. Okay, so I believe that is it for our presentation on the Internet of Things. I uh, learned what it was. I learned a couple problems about it and how you can combat those problems and how to deploy the Internet of Things at your organization. Are there anything else, any, any comments, any questions, any concerns anybody might have? The floor is open. I, I wonder, guys, if um, you looked into or ran across where um, they went and put something in there, but it actually ended up being worse than the original human solution, assuming that the Internet of Things was a, was a solve all. Uh, humans can do a lot more stuff than a computer can considering most of most advanced computers are around the age of six or seven right now? That's a good question, Michael. I actually did not uh, come across any case studies that mentioned IoT implementation having a, not being uh, as beneficial as having a, a human do it. Uh, I don't know, Jonathan, do you come across anything in your readings? No, I was actually going to throw out, throw that over to you. I don't remember uh, running into any cases where IoT re went really badly. Uh, so uh, one of the questions from the from the chat here is: uh, For the pilot, do you have a minimum number of users suggested? Uh, no, there's, if you have a small organization, then you may just uh, apply it, you know, somewhere with a couple people or something like that. Uh, and maybe the application that you're organization might not even be relevant to the number of users. Say, for example, you're uh, keeping track of multiple uh, manufacturing lines. Uh, so maybe you might apply it on one line and it, the, the number of users really doesn't apply to that. So uh, just, you, you know, this is something you'll need to look at for your organization and fit, fit the guidelines to fit what works for you. All right, uh, does anybody else have any other questions? There's some comments in the chat. There are, there are about uh, someone burning up my AC, which is entertaining. I'm not, I've, I haven't actually looked at what the, uh, like the security of the nest out to the outside world is, uh, which might be enter enter interesting. Uh, Cause there's like two levels of that. There's the AC unit and the private network, which is basically just Wi-Fi connection. Uh, and that, you know, the outside of the network over to the Nest servers and all the stuff that's happening on the server. So there's a lot of different attack points there. So, you know, might be, might be reasonably easy to get into. Here's a question for the group, and this is kind of random, but does anybody know with, with Tesla and the way that they're automatic driving uh, system works. Is that all self-contained within the vehicle or does that report out to a, a server that gives it the information like topographically and geographically on how to navigate uh, the roads? I would guess it's kind of like your phone's GPS, right? Where it actually downloads to the local device anything in the near area yeah that's that's what i was thinking as well i guess from a security perspective right if if you have this two-way communication if someone were i mean and i guess that would be a question for elon musk really there somebody underneath him to figure out how exactly the system works but uh as we get more and more automated with with these pedestrian vehicular systems i wonder how that'll 
play out in terms of IoT things. Anybody else? So I, I had a, some little bit of input from a, a little bird uh, about Tesla, uh, that the Wi-Fi, it's basically <laughs> got Wi-Fi running the whole time that puts out uh, all of its telemetry, like, constantly. OK. So uh, I believe that is our presentation. Uh, if you have any other questions or concerns or uh, anything else, feel free to get in touch with us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great session tonight, everyone. I appreciate the applause. You're getting applause and adoration. I appreciate you, your presentation, and I appreciate you all uh, showing up tonight and participating. So another nice class in the books. Um, that's all I have for tonight. Anybody questions, concerns? All right, we're good to go. We have just, we are now in April, we have uh, although it feels like, yeah, end of February, beginning of March here in Pennsylvania, we have just several weeks left. So carry on. See you next week. Bye. Good night. Good night, all.